Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I am Kira Epstein, the program coordinator at the New School at Commonweal. And today's conversation is co presented by two longtime Commonweal programs, the New School and the Collaborative for Health and Environment, or CHE. CHE's executive director, Kristen Schaefer, and I are both really honored to welcome Christina Marusek and Sedu Oboot Witherspoon and Sandra Steingraber for a conversation about science, storytelling, and a new war on cancer. And we also thank our promotional partner, Breast Cancer Prevention Partners. I will turn this over to Kristen in a minute to introduce herself and her guests. But for those of you who haven't been with us before, the New School at Commonweal is a learning community, dialogue, and conversation that explores how to build more resilience and better stewardship for body, soul, community, and the earth. We produce our conversations and we make them available for thousands of listeners worldwide on YouTube, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. We've been doing this since 2007, and in fact, we hosted Sandra for a conversation with our host and director, Michael Lerner, in 2007. So welcome back, Sandra. I think that's it. I'm going to turn it over now to Kristen, the director of Commonwealth's Collaborative for Health and Environment. Over to you, Kristen. Thanks so much, Kira. And thanks so much to everyone who's joining us today uh, for our Che Cafe. We're very excited for this conversation. Uh, before we dive in, I'd like to say just a few words about the Collaborative for Health and Environment, or CHE, and also introduce myself briefly. Um, starting with CHE, the Collaborative was established just over 20 years ago with the goal of protecting people on the planet by amplifying the latest peer-reviewed science to support changes in policy and practice. We work with partners to offer three to four free webinars every month. Uh, bringing the voices of experts and affected communities to our national audience of researchers, policymakers, and advocates. We also host science-served discussion groups focused on particular environmental health topics, and we have a long history of organizing strategic convenings on key issues in the environmental health field. I stepped in as director of CHE about a year ago, um, bringing more than three decades of experience in the environmental health field, including a stint at EPA headquarters and 25 years in the world of science-based pesticide advocacy with the Pesticide Action Network, or PAN. Uh, children's health has been a particular focus area for me over the years, and I worked with the scientists at PAN, particularly my former colleague, Dr. Emily Marquez, to produce two reports highlighting science linking pesticide exposure to children's health harms. And one of the strongest links we found was between prenatal pesticide exposure and increased risk of childhood cancers, which we'll hear a bit more about during today's conversation. And like many of us, I've lost friends and family members to cancer. So the issue of cancer prevention is a very personal one. So with that, let's dive in. We have three amazing speakers for today's conversation, as you know, focusing in on Christina Marusic's recently released book, A New War on Cancer, The Unlikely Heroes Revolutionizing Prevention. In addition to Christina herself, we have two environmental health leaders who I've had the opportunity to work with and deeply admire for many years, Dr. Sandra Steingraber and Nsedu Obit Witherspoon, both of whom I'll introduce properly a bit later on. Together, we'll consider Christina's findings on current cancer trends and what's been missing in our 40-year war on cancer. We're, we'll also explore the importance of storytelling in communicating complex and sometimes overwhelming scientific information. As Kira noted, we'll have time to bring some of your questions into the discussion as well, so please do drop them into the Q&A box at any time. So now I have the great pleasure of introducing Christina Marusic. Christina is an award-winning journalist of environmental health sciences who, um, for, who covers environmental health and justice at ehn.org and dailyclimate.org. She holds an MFA in nonfiction writing from the University of San Francisco. Her personal essays and reporting have been published by outlets including CNN, Slate, Vice, Women's Health, The Washington Post, MTV News, The Advocate, and Bustle, among others. Christina lives in Pittsburgh with her partner of 10 years, Michael, and the cutest dog in the world, Mochi. 
Christina will kick off our discussion by sharing some excerpts from her new book, which, by the way, is an amazing read that I highly recommend. So with that, Christina, please take it away. Hi, thank you so much, Kristen, for that lovely introduction and for hosting this today. Um, And thank you all so much for being here. I'm really excited to talk to you about my new book, but I'll start off by reading an excerpt from chapter one, and then I'll also read an excerpt from uh, chapter three, which is the chapter that Ense is in. She's joining us today. Um, I'll read for about 15 minutes and then we'll continue the discussion. On an 80 degree day that followed a week of snow in late April, 2021, I met Barry Breen at a coffee shop in Pittsburgh. She came directly from a hike at a nearby park. Her tank top and neon orange sports bra left the port in her chest exposed, a knotty lump above her left breast. Her frame was slight and she wore no makeup aside from delicately penciled in eyebrows. We sat on the cafe's shaded patio, sipping cold drinks and marveling over how the sudden shift in weather had changed everyone's mood. People grinned and greeted strangers in a kind of collective exuberance about swapping out coats and boots for shorts and summer dresses overnight, and finally feeling the warmth of the sun for the first time after a long, pandemic-addled winter. A journalist colleague who was friends with Barry had connected us, knowing I was writing a book about environmental exposures and cancer. He thought I should hear her story. It was our first meeting and Barry seemed a little nervous, which she compensated for by talking. I quickly learned that she grew up in Oil City, about 93 miles northeast of Pittsburgh, that Barry was her grandmother's maiden name, that she occasionally meets other women named Barry, B-A-R-I, but had met only one other Barry, B-E-R-R-Y, and that strangely, they had both worked at the same grocery co-op nearby. She's an artist, a painter and a musician, and works as a realtor to supplement her income. She has a half-sister who's 12 years older than she is and a brother who's 15 months older. She lives at the top of one of Pittsburgh's many hills with a roommate she described as a chill hippie, meditating, sober, likes to cook. We discovered that we're just four days apart in age, both born in March 1984, and she told me that this March, just before her 37th birthday, she'd had surgery to remove a cancerous tumor from her right breast. Then she'd lost 20 pounds and most of her hair while undergoing chemotherapy. Between sips of tea, she showed me the scar from her lumpectomy, a thin red line beneath her right armpit. She also showed me her new hair, taking off her hat and running her fingers over the short brown and gray fuzz that coated her scalp. In September 1993, more than 500 people gathered in downtown Boston for the city's annual, third annual Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition March. After the walk, event organizers asked anyone who'd experienced breast cancer to step inside a large outline of the state of Massachusetts they'd painted on the ground. Suddenly, the shape was crowded with bodies, bandanas or headscarves covering heads that were bald from chemotherapy. People cried and clung to their spouses or children. With all these pink ribbons everywhere, it's hard to believe now that not long ago, breast cancer was a hidden disease. Julia Brody, the executive director of Silent Spring Institute, a cancer prevention research nonprofit, told me in 2020. In the 1990s, women were just beginning to talk about their experiences publicly and connect with other women who'd had the disease. For many of the women at that rally, this was the first time they'd ever publicly acknowledged that they'd had breast cancer. It was incredibly emotional seeing that they weren't alone. At the time, the mortality rate from breast cancer was around 31 deaths per 100,000 people in the U.S., significantly higher than the current mortality rate of 20 per 100,000. The National Breast Cancer Coalition, including the Massachusetts chapter that sponsored the march, circulated a petition urging President Bill Clinton to develop a national strategy to address the disease. I take care of women with breast cancer every day, and I have seen too many patients die. Dr. Susan Love, one of the founders of the National Breast Cancer Coalition, told the Boston Globe reporter who covered the march in 1993, we have to be so obnoxious that they cure this disease just to get rid of us. Their plea was effective. Over the next decade, Congress allocated hundreds of millions of dollars for breast cancer research, and mortality rates dropped about 24%. But a quieter, parallel movement was also being launched at the same time, one aimed at stopping breast cancer before it started. The Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition had been active since 1991, but 1993 was the first year the state had ever published cancer rates by town. The report revealed that nine pounds on Cape Cod had significantly higher rates of breast cancer than the state average. 
The group called for a scientific investigation into why, but they were frustrated by the lack of existing laboratories capable of performing the investigation. So with a few million dollars from the Massachusetts legislature, they founded their own, bringing in scientists with diverse expertise. They named it Silent Spring Institute in honor of Rachel Carson, whose groundbreaking 1962 book, Silent Spring, brought national attention to the dangers posed by many pesticides, effectively launching the modern environmental movement. Carson died of breast cancer two years after the book came out. They were really a remarkable, visionary group of women, Julia said, referring to the activists who founded Silent Spring Institute. Now, they say they were naive at the time, and didn't realize how hard that kind of investigation was going to be. But that's lucky. If they had, they never would have achieved so much. When the researchers first went to work trying to figure out why Cape Cod had elevated levels of breast cancer, they quickly discovered the difficulty of such an undertaking. Cancer is a complex disease with many causes. And while scientists generally know how cancer occurs at a cellular level, it's still virtually impossible to trace one person's cancer to one or more specific environmental exposures let alone tracing exposures for numerous people, all with different health histories and habits. In 1994, only a limited number of studies had set out to do such a thing, so Silent Spring Institute researchers had to develop methodologies as they went. They enlisted help from researchers at Boston University, Tufts, Brown University, and Harvard, and conducted extensive analyses of the cancer data available at the time. They also developed new scientific methods to test air, dust, and urine for chemicals linked to breast cancer risk, then used those methods to test samples from 120 households on Cape Cod. They tested wastewater, groundwater, and drinking water for potentially cancer-causing compounds, and conducted interviews with more than 2,000 Cape Cod women, both with and without histories of breast cancer, to collect decades' worth of data on risk factors, health histories, habits and activities, and places of residence. The project was so thorough and innovative, according to Brody, that it became a model for environmental health studies across the country. In the end, the researchers didn't find a smoking gun that explained the elevated cancer rates on Cape Cod, but they did find a surprising number and variety of potentially cancer-causing chemicals in most of the homes they looked at. While the study didn't exactly answer the riddle that Silent Spring Institute had set out to solve, the researchers quickly realized their data had much larger implications. Many of the chemicals they found in people's homes came from drinking water contamination and common household products, so it seemed likely that homes across the country were experiencing similar exposures. But for the most part, no one else was looking for them, at least in the United States. They had inadvertently discovered that Americans were being exposed to a host of potentially cancer-causing chemicals on a daily basis and were largely unaware. Um, and now I'm going to read a bit from the uh, beginning of the chapter about NSA, uh, which is called Safer Little Ones Through Politics. Barry's hometown, Oil City, sits in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains where the Allegheny River and Oil Creek converge in Venango County, about 70 miles north of Pittsburgh. The area was once a Seneca Indian village named Onenge, meaning otter or mink, which white colonizers misheard as Venango. The chief of the wolf clan of the Seneca Nation, Corn Planter, was given back a tract of land that's now part of Oil City as payment for helping with negotiations up to the American Revolutionary War, but the county later attempted to retake the land from him for non-payment of taxes. Today, monuments to Corn Planter can be seen around town in Oil City, which was named for its role in the birth of the American oil industry. On August 27th, 1859, one of the world's first oil wells was drilled in Titusville, about 16 miles north of Oil City. Oil City sits alongside a bend in the Allegheny River. The bend slows currents down, making it an ideal place for barges and boats to land, so it soon became a shipping hub for the burgeoning industry. In the town's heyday, riverboats transported millions of barrels of crude oil from Oil City to Pittsburgh. Pennzoil, Quaker State, and Wolf's Head Motor Companies were all founded in Oil City. The local population grew steadily until it peaked at around 22,000 in 1930. It then began a slow but steady decline as the oil industry fell into its ongoing cycle of booms and busts. By the 1990s, Pennzoil, Quaker State, and Wolf's Head had all relocated their headquarters elsewhere. Today, only around 9,000 people live in Oil City, including Barry's family. Nisedu Obut Witherspoon, or NSA for short, has spent 22 years working to help the 
keep harmful chemicals away from the most the people most vulnerable to them, children. She's the executive director of the Children's Environmental Health Network, a nonprofit based in Washington, D.C. that was started in the 90s. She has also served as an advisor for the CDC, the EPA, and the National Institutes of Health. And NSA is a co-leader of the science and health arm of the Cancer-Free Economy Network. Relative to their size, children breathe more air, drink more water, and eat more food than adults, and their systems are still developing. This means that their bodies are less efficient at filtering out toxic chemicals than adult bodies are. It also means that delicate hormone sensitive processes that are underway in kids can be interrupted by endocrine disrupting chemicals, throwing a wrench in development and raising cancer risk. Emerging science also indicates that parents' exposure to chemicals before and during pregnancy can increase the risk of childhood cancer, and that kids' earliest exposures increase their likelihood of developing cancer later in life. Despite the science, most American schools and daycares are filled with harmful chemicals that can make their way into kids' bodies, from all materials in school buildings, pest control and cleaning products, flame retardants in carpeting and furniture, and PVC plastic used to make chairs, toys, and utensils. Ensei has four children of her own. She gave me a virtual tour of the home she shares with her husband and kids in the DC area in 2021. With kids spanning the ages of five through 18, there was rarely a quiet moment. The kids teased each other, talked over one another, and guffawed over inside jokes. Over the years, they collected a bit of something for everyone. A ping pong table, a piano, video game consoles, Nerf guns, soccer balls, bins of dolls and blocks and puzzles and games, a punching bag, crystal and mineral collections, an air hockey table, a vast quantity of Pokemon cards, and boxes of hand-me-downs. They even have a swimming pool out back. Ense, who has golden brown skin and a wide, contagious smile, said she's always had an affinity for children, but having kids of her own amplified her protective instincts. Inevitably, you're mostly focusing on yourself and you, till you start caring for other little souls, she said. Becoming a mom made me feel even more strongly how important it is that we protect these vulnerable little people who aren't yet able to stand up and protect themselves. Through the Children's Environmental Health Network, in 2004, EMSA helped launch one of the first programs in the U.S. aimed at reducing chemicals in early child care facilities like daycares and preschools. A year later, the Oregon Environmental Health Council launched a similar state initiative, and in 2010, the groups merged the two and created the National Eco-Healthy Child Care Program. At the outset of these projects, Ensei said, there were already several programs aimed at preventing harmful chemical exposures in K-12 schools, but there were none for children younger than elementary school age. Initially, some of the Children's Environmental Health Network's board members were skeptical about whether such a program could be effective given the scale of the problem but they started small, launching pilot programs in a few states that offered free trainings for childcare providers on how to reduce chemical use and why it was important. Enze served as a trainer during the program's early days when demand quickly grew through word of mouth. It was really powerful to be in places from Georgia to rural Georgia to California, watching people have the same kinds of reactions to this information we were providing, she said. There's a whole emotional cycle that happens when people find out they've been exposed to harmful chemicals their whole lives without their permission. First, there's anger, then guilt, then usually more anger. There's this false thinking that as Americans, we're more protected than we actually are. Today, Ensei said, the program remains the only one in the country focused on preventing toxic exposures at early childcare facilities. It's available in most states and has trained more than 2,000 childcare professionals. It's also won several awards, including a 2019 Clean Air Excellence Award from the EPA. The program certifies facilities that comply with at least 30 of 35 free or low-cost practices. The checklist is detailed and comprehensive. It includes things like using non-toxic or less toxic pest control and cleaning methods, ensuring proper, proper ventilation, barring idling in parking areas, testing drinking water and soil for lead, choosing the least toxic toys and art materials, and switching to safer materials for furniture, paint, and carpeting when renovating, among many others. Trainers in the program also review the health threats posed by chemical exposure, learning, developmental, and neurological disabilities, reproductive harm, asthma, and cancer. We're not at all into scare tactics, Ensei said, but we believe people have the right to know these things so they can take steps to protect themselves and the children in their care. First, we empower them to do that. Then we try to 
help them take their angry energy and pivot it toward pushing for solutions on a large scale. Um, I will stop there and um, pass the screen back to Kristen. Christina, thank you so much. Even though I've already had a chance to read your book, that gave me goosebumps. So I really appreciate you you sharing today and hearing it in your own voice. Um, so we'll now turn to Ense Witherspoon, a longtime colleague and friend who, as you heard, is one of the unlikely heroes profiled in Christina's book. Ense is the executive director for the Children's Environmental Health Network, has for many years been a key spokesperson for children's vulnerabilities and the need for their protection. As you heard from Christina, she holds leadership roles in many spaces, including the External Science Board for the Environmental Influences on Child Health Outcomes at NIH, the Health Science Initiative of the Cancer Free Economy Network, and recently for the National Environmental Health Partnership Council. Uh, NCA is also a member of the board for both Pan North America and the Environmental Integrity Project, serves on Maryland's Children's Environmental Health Advisory Council, and one of CH CEHN's leadership awards. I love this. The Insedu Obot Witherspoon or Now Youth Leadership Award is named in her honor. She's also the recipient of many other awards, including the William R. Riley Award in Environmental Leadership from the Center for Environmental Policy, among others. So Ense, thank you so much for being here. And I'd like to now hand it over to you to share some thoughts on your cancer prevention work and also what it's like to have your story told in a book like Christina's. Please go ahead. Thank you, Kristen, Christina. Again, congratulations. Sandra, it's always um, a pleasure. And Che, thank you for using your fantastic platform for such an important conversation. And I know Che is very interested in the actions uh, that go beyond the conversation. Welcome to everyone. And I know we have a lot of our Cancer Free Economy Network and Childhood Cancer Prevention Initiative uh, colleagues and child health colleagues out here and overall public health leaders. So just appreciate you taking the time. As many of you know, I'm quite passionate about public health and learning from past harms so that we are all not a part of perpetuating those harms to current and future generations. So it is of course an honor uh, and I'm quite humbled to be highlighted in this way um, in Christina's book. And I remember meeting Christina a few years back in Pittsburgh uh, when I know you were, if you will, activated is the word I'll use uh, by attending a very important uh, cancer and environment symposium that many of our colleagues were heavily involved with in, in Pittsburgh uh, that I know helped to really set your trajectory and focus and we so appreciate you and your contributions to the field. Uh, you know, in order to have this highlight and to, and to be able to expand our reach, uh, it's wonderful. And to be able to extend our education efforts, again, at, uh, education for the point of getting people to act in whatever way that looks in, in, the, in the shape of your investment and the influence that one has. As we're all moving towards collective systemic change is what I would say, and then putting justice and health first, especially our most vulnerable, that is yet what I believe none of us have ever seen in our lifetime or in, this his in the history of this country. So as we've been discussing, the rates of many cancers, including childhood cancers, are on the rise and have been on the rise for the last 48 years. And one in three people in the US will be diagnosed with some form of cancer at some point in, in their lives. Also, the cumulative impacts of systemic racism and environmental injustice continue to take hold of marginalized communities that have never really had a chance uh, to really get ahead of these cumulative impacts, such as indigenous uh, communities, communities of color, and those living in low wealth communities. So unlike decades ago, we have a good amount of growing peer reviewed science that Christina's book highly emphasizes and many folks on this call uh, work in day in, day out. And the science that shows us that primary prevention of cancer is not only possible, but is also necessary if we truly want to get ahead of and make the type of traction in the area of short and long-term illness like cancer and others that we, that we claim that we wanna do as a society. The reality is that the vast majority of funding, science protocols, and attention overall is focused on, is focused on treating cancer versus preventing it. So we at the Children's Environmental Health Network and our colleagues and our partners are extremely focused on balancing out that attention to also include prevention. Now, we're not taking away from treatment. We all need medical advancements in treatment. And as Kristen started earlier, we all are personally impacted um, in our own lives and, and those uh, that we care about um, from cancer. 
So for the last eight years or so, the Children's Environmental Health Network has served as a leadership um, in the in the cancer free economy network. For those that don't know, we are a dynamic network of diverse teams, uh, experts, advisors, stakeholders working in environmental, social justice, health, science, policy, legal, labor, business, and communication sectors together for the first time to prevent cancer and accelerate progress towards a healthy, regenerative, and equitable economy for all. Because at the end of the day, when we're honest with ourselves, we have to recognize that our dependence on these carcinogens and other chemicals of concern also um, very much feed our economy. So we also provide science to this network, right? We are kind of the foundation that tries to translate and bring forth the evolving, quickly evolving science that continues to provide the foundation of our work and advocacy. We, for example, created a joint statement on cancer prevention, the first of its kind, that brings together healthcare professional associations with can uh, uh, cancer serving organizations and other public health groups that never before together in one voice are articulating and prioritizing the need to prevent cancer. The overall narrative in the shift of, of the cancer discussion. We also work with cancer centers such as Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And just tomorrow, there will be a hybrid um, online and in-person session uh, through Columbia uh, University and another cancer center, uh, Sandra and Edra Meyer Cancer Center, that will have a whole day of programming on cancer and environmental exposures. And Polly Hoppin, who's on, has been a big part of that. Julia Brody with Sun Spring Institute and many of our colleagues at the Cancer Free Economy Network. And we're also working on state cancer plans. Each uh, majority of states in the country have a state cancer plan. Vast majority of them do not even acknowledge environmental contributions. So that also needs to change. Uh, we need to make sure that our plans for trying to address uh, these very important, serious, short and long term concerns that impacts the entire family and community, I would say, uh, really need to acknowledge what the science is acknowledging and lived experience. We are also leaders in the Childhood uh, Cancer Prevention Initiative which includes leaders from the Cancer Free Economy Network and childhood cancer prevention organizations, healthcare associations, and sustainable business uh, leaders. So again, the rate of childhood cancer diagnosis has been increasing, has increased 34% since 1975, the year I was born, and has been steadily increasing every year. We know that uh, we released the first report of its kind on childhood cancer and cross strategies for prevention a few years back, which identifies some of the major routes, high level of exposures for children. That includes certain forms of pesticides, that includes uh, air pollution from vehicles in particular, and paints and solvents as high level uh, targets, if you will, that it, we can and need to be focusing on as a community to get ahead of these trends. We also are in discussions with uh, President Biden's cancer moonshot uh, team at the White House, trying to also engage around their defini definition of prevention and making sure that all of our federal agencies that are trying to implement this cancer moonshot plan also uh, gain the uh, benefit of our collective understanding in science, but also that we can help them in their work towards prevention that they're aiming as far as the goals that they're trying to fulfill. We also have a pesticides project that launched and we're working to implement actions around uh, an agenda to reduce exposure to pesticides where children spend the majority of their time. And then finally, also, some of us have been working with the pediatric environmental health specialty units. There's one in every region that have been working to train and educate cancer treatment specialists across the country, which is also a great way to build on change agents. So I would just say in, in closing, I'm quite honored and humbled to be highlighted in Christina's book, and we should not have to work so hard collectively uh, in the year 2023 to remind policy leaders, funders, and those who establish public health standards and research that children and their vulnerabilities and all vulnerable populations must be considered in all that we do, if not uh, at least the decision making, and, and that our children's voices are needed more than ever and we cannot claim ignorance here. The science is available and we need to move on it. So thank you. And I'm glad to be part of this conversation. And so thank you so much. I so appreciate all of your work. And I was so excited to see you highlighted in Christina's book as the public health hero you are. Um, now I'd like to bring in a longtime leader in the environmental health movement who I've been inspired by for many years, Dr. Sandra Steingraber. Sandra is a senior scientist with the Science and Environmental Health Network, 
was a distinguished scholar in residence at Ithaca College in New York from 2003 to 2021. She's the author of a trilogy of award-winning books on environmental health, the first of which, Living Downstream, an ecologist's personal investigation of cancer and the environment, was adapted into a documentary film in 2010. As an aside, Pan co-hosted a screening when I was there of this film in San Francisco with the Breast Cancer Prevention Partners. Um, Sandra also wrote Having Faith, An Ecologist's Journey to Motherhood, and Raising Elijah, Protecting Our Children in the Age of Environmental Crisis. Sandra has received numerous honors for her work as a researcher and science writer, including the Rachel Carson Leadership Award and others. In 2011, she donated the funds from her Heinz Prize Award to the anti-fracking movement and became co-founder of New Yorkers Against Fracking, a statewide coalition of hundreds of grassroots organizations that helped win a ban on fracking in New York in 2015. The 2018 documentary film Unfractured tells the story of New York State's fracking ban. So, Sandra, turning it over to you for your reflections, both on Christina's book and on the role of storytelling in science communications. Thanks for being here. Um, well, thank you for that introduction. And uh, Christina, brava, standing ovation, blowing kisses and throwing roses at you. Uh, and what an honor to be able to say a few things after um, Ense, who's um, a, certainly a personal hero of mine and enacts so many of the ideas in Christina's book. Um, I also want to give um, a big hello to my colleagues in the Science and Environmental Health Network who are um, here in the audience too. At uh, Science and Environmental Health Work Network, we try to provide um, good science and legal resources to frontline communities like those um, profiled in, um, in the book. And um, so I feel like I've finally at this age found <laughs> a really good home to do um, my own work as a um, environmental health researcher and an author. So um, I'm very glad to be embedded within the Science and Environmental Health Network. And if you don't know about our work, um, um, please um, take a look. Um, I'm also speaking to you today from Ridgecrest, California, um, near Death Valley in Kern County, um, California, which has some of the highest fracking um, here in, in the nation um, and has all kinds of water contamination problems and cancer clusters and so forth, but I'm actually not here as a researcher. Um, so uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about where I am and hopefully it will serve as a segue to the conversation today. Um, and the one first reason I need to mention it is because I'm at an Airbnb that does, turns out not to have a very good Wi-Fi connection. So if I should get disconnected, I'm going to try to quickly use my phone to reconnect with you, but so far so good. Um, the, the reason I'm here is not ha having anything to do with fracking or the water contamination that is alleged to exist in so many communities that I'm um, now living within um, temporarily, but rather I'm here um, for um, to visit a relative who has recently died. And I, in fact, right before I got um, on the call, I was just helping to write her obituary. I, as you might know, am an adoptee. And so part of my story that I have written about is the way that cancer has run in my adopted family, including I was diagnosed very early on with bladder cancer and I have an aunt who had the same kind of cancer I had. My mother, my adoptive mother and I were actually in cancer treatment at the same time. She was diagnosed with breast cancer at an early age. And so part of my story, um, those of you who know it, is to make clear that just because cancer runs in families, it doesn't necessarily run in genes. And as an adoptee who was raised in a family um, where, where I don't share chromosomes, I feel kind of like a living example of the, the importance of environmental exposures. And um, part of the work that I've done is in my own writings to return back to my hometown, become a kind of environmental detective there and uncover that I was, was just one data point in a whole cluster of cancers um, because uh, po very possibly because of contaminated drinking water and also because um, of some of the worst air quality um, in central Illinois. Um, so, uh, but I'm here <laughs> to bury the rel a relative who's my birth relative, who I it took me 40 years to find. Um, as an adoptee, you might know that there's still secrecy surrounding adoption, preventing us adoptees from knowing who our um, biological ancestors are. And my uh, anger over that secrecy was actually 
determinative in my anger over secrecy around right to know laws and around toxic exposures. So that, so I just have, I'm kind of um, self-righteously angry about secrets of all kinds that affect and harm people who need to know, um, have an actionable need to know about something. Um, so um, I have, I came here to find a great aunt of mine who was one of the few people who have welcomed me into um, the, the family I was uh, born into by blood. Um, she is um, uh, an ex-nun. Um, she was brought as a child from uh, rural Oklahoma out to the Central Valley of California during the Dust Bowl. She's led an extraordinary life. And I finally, through DNA testing and through search angels and all kinds of um, runarounds of the secrecy that surrounds adoption. I finally found her and, um, she invited me to her home out here in Ridgecrest, California and, um, and died a week later. Um, and what brought her to the hospital the second day I was here was, um, a terrible urinary tract infection. And as a bladder cancer patient, I have had many, many of these and know how awful they are. So uh, her caregiver and I had to call an ambulance, took her in. She had a massive infection. And then the resulting workup showed that she actually had an ovarian tumor that was pressing on her kidney and her ureter. And environment, um, antibiotics through uh, IV helped turn that around. But while she was in the hospital, she suffered a massive stroke. Um, so I just got to meet her and spend a couple of days with her. I got to hear some family stories. And then I got to hold her hand while she died just a few days ago. And you have to understand, having never met a biological relation other than my own two children, holding the hand of an actual ancestor of mine and helping her through that passage was uh, profound. Uh, and I uh, turned out to be the only member of the family who was with her. And yet I hardly knew her as family. So it's a emotional time for me, but it's important that I be here because this is exactly, um, Christina's book exactly hits on my situation in a way and the situation of so many of us, because um, even though my aunt may also have had cancer, my birth aunt, as well as people in my adoptive family, the point is that we can do nothing about our ancestry and nothing about the DNA we've inherited, whether or not we've inherited DNA that make us more vulnerable to cancer formation or not. But we can do everything about carcinogens in our environment. Um, and so Christina is exactly right that um, removing carcinogens from our economy is, is the rational place to begin uh, any pro kind of program of, of cancer prevention. Um, and that doesn't mean that knowing our heredity is not important. Um, but uh, what I have learned as a cancer patient myself is that the reason we need to know our in inheritance is not so much to know why we have cancer, but it's to make the medical system move for us. If I didn't know that one of my biological relatives had an early onset colon cancer, I would not have been able to compel the insurance company to pay for my colonoscopy at 35, which showed I also had a colon lesion that needed to be removed that almost certainly could have killed me at a young age. Um, but it just so happened I had at that time one other tiny piece of information about my biological family, which was that my maternal grandmother, my aunt's sister, the one who just died, she she had had colon cancer when she was young. That was a little detail I knew, and it may have saved my life. Not because inheritance causes colon cancer, but because um, we overdetermine the role of heredity in allowing uh, cancer patients to have access to early detection and um, in paying for and helping us pay for that. So now I know my aunt, my great aunt, had ovarian cancer. I actually had my ovaries out at a young age and threw myself into surgical menopause and had to pay for that myself because I didn't have a family history uh, to offer at that point, right? So um, I can't um, emphasize enough that no one asks you as a cancer patient, did you grow up near a toxic waste site, which also is a risk factor for both bladder and colon cancer and is just as determinative as some kind of aunt, sister, grandmother, mother who may have had that disease. So that is why the work that Christina is doing um, as an author and a reporter and the work that NSA is doing as an activist really matters and is absolutely life-saving and is also just 
backed by science. Um, the, the science is very clear that a very tiny percent of cancers are actually caused by straight up inheritance of, of, a, of a genetic factor. And, um, and in 90% of the cases, uh, environmental exposures and also things like our diet, which is not, uh, of course, also comes to us as part of the environment, um, is really what um, really matters. So thanks to NSA and to Christina for shining this um, light on exactly where it should be should be shown. Um, now, I myself have written um, about these things as an author, so I want to pivot a little bit now and close by sort of talking about how we tell narratives about this. Talking about cancer is scary. Um, it's um, kind of taboo still. Uh, no, everyone likes to walk around kind of whistling past the graveyard and pretending that they won't be diagnosed. And so reading a story where you feel empathy towards somebody who's facing a catastrophic diagnosis and lives in a toxic place is um, a hard kind of exercise. And a lot of people avoid doing that. And so I know that I have to think strategically as a writer about what um, sort of writing um, tactics and strategies uh, that we know as kind of creative writers or reporters will keep my readers turning pages and not turn away from the story, right? And so for me, I kind of combine autobiography and um, sort of personal witness and test and sort of the feeling of testifying to what I've seen in my hometown and in my adoptive family. Um, and I combine that with what I know as a biologist and kind of braid together a couple of narratives. And I, I believe that there's power in that. I believe in the work that I do. But I just want to say that um, Christina's work has another kind of power for me because it's not just one person's voice. She, ha she has brought together a constellation of voices, NSA being one, um, all of whom are heroic in their own way and are engaged in the hard work of activism and policy out of the trauma of, a can of cancer diagnoses of them or their children or the people in their family and community. And so the, um, the power of that kind of narrative is that you don't, aren't just limited to, like you read my book, you're just limited to what Steingraber has to, how she experienced the world in one place. Um, but in Christina's book, you see um, not just, um, not just one place, right? Not just um, one person. So I, I feel like there's three things going on here. One, by showing us, by centering the human lives behind the data, she rehumanizes the experience of being a cancer patient. Um, so we're, we're, we see the, the, um, the, the person who's got cancer, the person who's taking care of people who have cancer, that, that it's, we see the world through their eyes. So there's a rehumanization that takes place. But more than that, and I think you heard that from her, um, the excerpt she read, you also see the environment in which these people live. So if there's environmental history, there, we see the sort of ecological roots, not just in anyone, what's happening now, but what might have happened, you know, in Oil City uh, decades ago that, um, have created a situation for people now. And so in, in that kind of making that visual for us, we see the human rights crisis that is cancer because we see that decisions, environmental decisions and decisions around toxic chemicals that were made 80 years before people were born are, are now harming these folks. And so somebody profited from that, but somebody else is paying the price with their lives. And so you see the kind of... Um, so you see the person as a, a, a real human being, you see the environment that they live in and how it shaped the, the health problems that they have. But then the third thing that makes this book so remarkable to me is that you see how those individuals took the trauma of their own experience and um, their love for the community that they live in and became activists and did the hard work of engaging in policy and, um, and, it's, and straight up activism and, and, there, and not just one person, but many people, so that as you read the chapters, you could imagine yourself um, sort of like some people I felt more like me than other people in the chapter, right? So you have like a menu of people that you could choose to be your role model. I guess that's what I want to say. And um, for me, it's those three things, making those, those people human and having agency, showing that the whole community in which they live in the environmental history that 
impinged upon it, and then revealing how those individuals became did the heroic work of activism and policy. And that, to me, is a, just a remarkable thing. And so, again, I want to um, I'll just say congratulations at what um, a remarkable triumph and how great it is to then have with us one of the people in one of the chapters um, and say who who's, um, can speak to us, um, kind of bring the whole thing to life. Um, so lastly, Dick Clapp is on this call, and I just want to uh, let everyone know that one of the great heroes of, in, of environmental epidemiology who helped me actually analyze the data for my own book and who served as a cancer registrar in the state of Massachusetts before his retirement, along with um, had a whole career in going into communities as a scientist and revealing the um, connections between uh, environmental exposures and health. Um, he's kind of the grandfather of all of this. Um, I, and I see that he's in Maine, so hope he's in a beautiful place listening in. And what an honor to have Dr. Clapp uh, on the call. Okay, over back over to you, Kristen. Sandra, thank you so much. And thank you for bringing your, the personal moment that you're in into this discussion and sharing with us um, the connections to the work that we're that we're doing here and the stories that are being shared. So thank you. Uh, okay, I'd like to move us um, into conversation. And uh, before we dive in, I see there are a handful of uh, great questions in the Q&A, but I have a couple of questions to get us started with. I actually want to build on, Sandra, what you what you were diving into of kind of the difference of writing as an individual and writing as a journalist. And I would add to that list sort of writing and storytelling as an advocate. Right. And I'm wondering if each of you can reflect a little bit on what the hurdles are um, for each of those kinds of writings, what the power is uh, in communicating this kind of complex and often overwhelming information in ways that are going to reach people and motivate them. Um, Christina, maybe you can start us off. So I think in my work as a journalist, um, I think a big part of the job is um, I think of it as translating. And certainly that's true in science communication. You know, I kind of think of science communication as uh, I generally, my process is talking to people who have a lot of expertise in this subject matter, like Sandra, um, trying my best, you know, asking every stupid question I can think of to make sure I kind of fundamentally understand what's going on. And then um, trying to rephrase that in language that's accessible to non-scientists um, without losing important nuances. Um, and I think uh, I rely a lot on the goodwill and patience of scientists who are trying to explain things to me in that context. Um, I often send them what I've written to confirm that I didn't lose anything in translation. Um, when I'm talking to, you know, kind of telling other people's stories, um, that's a different kind of translation. Um, and I think comes with a, a different sense of responsibility to really um, make sure that I get it right and honor their experiences. I also think, um, you know, I feel like a duty to kind of protect my sources. Um, you know, it's really different telling your own story and offering your own vulnerability is really challenging and brave and comes with its own, um, you know, unique hurdles to overcome. And then when you're telling other people's stories, um, I really want to make sure they know what they're getting into, right? That they um, are aware of what might happen if their story is out in the world and how it's going to feel to hear from other people. Even, you know, I read a few sections about Barry. Um, she came to my book launch here in Pittsburgh and I, I had breakfast with her in advance to say, Hey, if you're in the room, how do you feel about me reading a part of the book that you're in? And she was like, Oh, great. No big deal. Totally fine. And I said, okay, just so you know, one thing that might happen is that a bunch of people might come up to you afterwards and want to tell you about their cancer experience or their mom's cancer experience. And that can be really emotionally overwhelming. You know, that can be a lot if you're not in the right headspace for it. And she was like, oh, yeah, I didn't think 
think about that. Maybe actually, uh, could that be like a game day decision for me? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to default to not doing that. Or, and then the other question was, do you want me to say that you're in the room? This is Barry. She's right here. Do you want to wave? Um, and, and after we really talked it through and what might happen as a result, she was like, actually, maybe, um, I'll just kind of stay quiet. So I think, I think Mm -hmm. one of the hurdles is, um, you know, just making sure that I account for that, that I account for the fact that I'm telling other people's stories, but then it's their vulnerabilities that are going to be out in the world. Yeah, no, that's really, that's really interesting and and appreciated, right? To be so thoughtful about how folks are going to feel that and say, maybe we could turn to you as one of the folks who was profiled and see if you have any thoughts along those lines about how it felt to kind of sort of see your personal story reflected um, and whether you've had conversations and follow up. And then, and then also uh, relatedly, like the, your communication strategy as an advocate, which is also sort of telling the stories in ways that are going to motivate people to act. Any thoughts to share on that? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, We need a lot more of, of this experience uh, taking hold for sure. I think the days of lecturing, um, you know, as a broad sense in our community, or, I mean, come on, the COVID pandemic, the height of the COVID pandemic sadly showed us many things and it showed us we cannot take one or two approaches to our communication and expect that we're going to have a massive um, experience that then gets us where in theory as a collective we are hoping to get. Uh, So we, this is not, you know, this is nothing too new, but just a reminder that we have to meet people where they are. We have to know our audience, right? We, we have to do a bit. Uh, and that also engages trust building that engages it. I might not be the best messenger, right? But whom in the community may be the best messenger, mm-hmm. especially when we're talking about speed of time and urgency. The train derailment, I mean, we have train derailments all the time. The train derailment that, you know, got a lot of uh, press in the recent months. That was such a quick urgency for communication, effective communication. People needed to know where to go, what the impacts were going to be, when they should move back. I mean, we didn't have the luxury collectively in public health of time. So it's like, you know, again, having the reliable messengers who have the appropriate message in theory that then can help people get to the the point of making their decisions, but hopefully with a more informed state of mind. And I would say the storytelling aspect, I mean, again, this is not new. This A lot of this comes from our indigenous history in this country and beyond. There are a lot of cultures that have used storytelling forever. And the, the huge value of that is that, again, um, many folks that tend to not see each other on the same side politically or maybe can't or think that there isn't not a whole lot in common between the zip codes that one was brought up or spends time in or the, the circles by which we spend time in. The storytelling aspect allows that human to human connection. I may not completely understand your story, but odds are there's something in your story that I can relate to. Mm -hmm. And there's a human psychology of that that is well evidence and based and even gets into some racial healing work that I've done. When you can connect with people on a human to human level, again, we don't have to be best friends. That's not what we're aiming to do here, but we are aiming as humans that need to live in this space together to try to at least hear each other out, come to some form of solution that we can all benefit. We have yet to see that at a large scale, but it is exciting for me to see, encouraging to see more and more, especially community oriented programs, really prioritizing uh, a storytelling approach. And it takes time. Again, you can't rush that, (laughs) you know, and to build that into grants and to make sure that there is adequate time for communities to build trust, understand whom they're working with, whom their information is coming from, to better understand the signs that I also perpetuate often and not assuming that just because I translate it into a third grade reading level, that someone is still going to understand what that means for their daily life to then make proactive action. Mm -hmm. And then also understanding the real emotions here, the true valid emotions that I I think I was speaking to in the piece that Christina mentioned. I'm angry. People are angry, right? When when they come to Mm -hmm. this point of understanding this information, much more than not, I keep running into people who want to then do something about it, even within the amount of time that they may have to do it. But there's also this digestion of what do you mean when I go out and bring food into my home it's contaminated. What do you mean when I put on lotions on my young child that probably has had stuff that I did not want them to have? What do you mean when I'm warming up their baby bottle, unless it's a certain type of, in my aspect, very expensive baby bottle, there's no risk there to that child um, being exposed to certain forms of plasticizers and other things. So, you know, we have to allow this evolution to happen. It's not on my timeline. It's on the timeline of community members that we are, in essence, trying to serve while we are all trying to learn here. I certainly don't have it all together. 
But how can I lift up my story as Christina has so, <laughs> I think, delicately done in this book to hopefully help others take a moment to understand we're all in this. I'm a mom too. I don't have all the answers. I can't buy my way out of this. None of us can, but we have to do better by taking care of each other. That's that's where I think. And I think that human connection is a different type of learned experience than, than any textbook at times and any article or peer review journal can provide. Hey, very powerful thoughts. Thank you for sharing and say, um, I want to note that that uh, as we're reaching the top of the hour that we are scheduled to go to about quarter after. So we do have time for a bit more discussion. Um, and Sandra, I wanted to come back to you just to you mentioned in your uh, remarks, the kind of delicate interweaving of the individual, your perspective as an individual and your perspective as a scientist and how that's really been kind of how you've moved forward with with the books that you've that you've shared with the world. I wonder if you want to add anything about that, the challenges of that or, or what you think is powerful about that strategy. Um, well, I guess, that you know, that I don't have to worry about um, uh, asking anyone else if they're ready for the fallout that's going to happen. I just have to check in with myself and do my own self discernment because it is absolutely the truth that I, my book signing lines are filled with people who have to tell me their own cancer stories. And I have a box of things of gifts that people have given me, including, you know, this is the, this is the, um, program from my sister's funeral where she wanted an excerpt of one of your books read aloud. Here's the coat that my sister went bird watching before she died of ovarian cancer. She wanted you to have this. So, um, you know, I just have to check in with myself about this. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, because my situation is actually slightly unusual, I think, in that I grew up in a very, um, a, a town that was really considered a kind of sacrifice place um, for the industry. There are 30 different industries, um, including two coal burning power plants. Um, and yet it's an all white community, essentially. It's a white working class community that for very particular historical reasons, starting with the Supreme Court decision in 1900 about redirecting the flow of a river that brought all kinds of sewage uh, and slaughterhouse waste that killed off the fishing industry and the pearl button industry because we had clams that opened the door. You know, one, in, one dirty industry attracts another. And we ended up being, it's coal country, Illinois. We ended up being the place where the big coal plant for, Chicago, you know, that powered Chicago is located. So we breathed in all the air. Um, there are all kinds of solvents in the drinking water. But it's, as an all-white community, that's actually not a typical story. And so the environmental justice piece of it um, really disproportionately affects our Black and brown brothers and sisters more than people like me. And so that's a story and that's a message I can't really carry, right? That, and that's where I see the power of um, journalism, which allows a kind of reportage that can not only look at the trends in the cancer in the spatial and temporal trends in the cancer data, but can look at who the communities are who are mostly disproportionately affected and, and then uplift them and provide agency and shine that kind of spotlight. So that's um, work that I don't engage in myself as a biologist and um, a kind of more lyrical writer that comes out of the kind of tradition of Rachel Carson, but that I see happening in certain kinds of journalism being practiced um, by Christina, but also as, as a biologist who is one of the editors and authors of <clears throat> the Fracking Science Compendium, which some of you may know is a big project of um, the Concerned Health Professionals of New York now in its ninth edition. So we're working on the ninth edition. And that is now coming out of the Science and Environmental Health Network, with for whom we, we are now a project and a partner of. Um, what we've noticed, those of us who are the sort of scientists, especially Carmi Orenstein and myself, who are the two kind of principals of that project, that there are things that the that investigative journalists have uncovered that we are profiled because science can't. And, and doesn't go to those places. And I think science sometimes has a hand tied behind its back um, because of um, databases that are not available in the public. Um, and yet investigative reporters have things like Freedom of Information Act requests that they can ferret out stuff that scientists don't actually have available to them. And so there's a power in investigative reporting um, that 
um, sometimes the scientists who want to um, profess objectivity um, confuse, I think, scientific objectivity with political neutrality. And so scientists will um, almost self-censor and, and not even be willing to represent their own data, for example, and te testify before um, state legislatures or other federal agencies. It's, um, I mean, again, Dr. Dick Clapp is a rare exception to that. And I've learned from him how to speak data to power. Um, but there's um, a way in which investigative reporting um, goes to those places and doesn't confuse objectivity with political neutrality the way I feel like some of my scientist friends do. Um, also, uh, when you publish in the peer-reviewed medical literature, honestly, maybe six people read your whole thing. When you publish as a journalist, you get um, many more readers. You have this big public platform. And, and I say that even knowing that journalism and um, newspapers especially are suffering right now but there's there's still a kind of power that the platform has that i just am in awe of um, and i should say i'll close by saying my own son i'm very proud of he just graduated from college and he, as a journalism major and now is going to start a two-year stint as an investigative reporter focused on the climate crisis as part of Report for America, which places young journalists in underserved communities. So he's moving to rural South Carolina where there's no daily newspaper to try to provide coverage to local communities. And so I'm really ha happy to see that he has looked at my own work as growing up with it as a child and, um, and sees that, you know, journalism actually has a kind of power that mom's work doesn't and that I can do, do that work. So uh, uh, when I see Christina kind of as somebody operating in that, um, you know, who has that kind of power behind her as a reporter, it just it's something that I have just absolute respect for. Um, there's just different narrative strategies that, and, and a different way, a different tradition of looking at what's objective that, that um, scientists and, and writers of memoir and autobiography, we just don't have that kind of power. So I'm in awe of it. Yeah, thanks for that, Sandra, and congratulations on Elijah moving into that work. Um, all right, we're going to turn to some of the questions in the Q&A and, and start with a question that sort of builds on what we've been talking about in terms of the challenging message um, that that and the messaging and, and how, um, how to move that forward. So Jean-Marie asks, when writing about environmental causes of cancer, how do you balance the grim and the hopeful? And how do you pitch projects on subjects that many would rather remain blissfully unaware about? Um, so maybe uh, Ense, I'll start with, start with you if you have any thoughts on that question. Mm, it's a good point. Um, ignorance is bliss, right? It, it, I mean, again, these are very emotionally charged issues. I mean, and I would even go broader. You know, no, no one that I've ever run into admits in public that they want to see a child harmed or anyone harmed or a future pregnant mother, you know, and yet our actions do not support ensuring that we reduce those risks. Um, and it doesn't feel good, right, to see a child or to learn about a child or, or anyone who we know had nothing to do with the state of where we are, uh, the state of wondering if we can breathe generally decent air today on the East Coast or the West Coast or our water supply, our food supply, all of it. Uh, so um, for me, it's not backing down. I mean, maybe it's also I've been at this a while too, right? A couple of decades. And I feel I don't I don't have too much more to lose at this point. Um, you know, there are people to Christina's point that will interview and then miscategorize. And you can tell I try to um, I'm very careful taking interviews when I, you know, uh, I try to do as much interviewing of the of the reporter uh, as much as they are of me. There have been times uh, very recently there was a New York Times article on child care in Head Start programs. And I got a lot of calls about it right when it finally um, printed. And and as I suspected, there was definitely an agenda. Um, in my humble opinion, there was an agenda because uh, the, the way that the question was posed already had a very biased view of what and what, what was not happening. And I thought it was a very unfair picture for an industry even prior to the COVID pandemic uh, that has been um, in need of help and attention for a very long time. And I don't think it, it helps any of us to... Um, to villainize uh, a part of our industry that is trying to support children in healthy environments rather than trying to you know, do what we can to bring them the information that we have. 
what we've learned from our Eco Healthy Child Care program is that nine times out of 10, most providers have never even had the basic information that you all have heard today that goes even beyond carcinogens, it goes to chemical exposures. So uh, it should not be surprising, sadly, when uh, there are certain things found uh, that have not been part of protocol, standard setting, policy. Uh, it doesn't mean it, does, it goes unnoticed, of course, but I don't think blasting an entire industry in the New York Times is, is going to get us where we need to go, in my humble opinion. And then I've had other interviews that have been a spark, and I hope is Christina's book is one of those examples that has then led to agencies and, and, and discussions that then led to actual uh, introduction of bills that have started to make a difference. California and other states have been a great example, right? These things didn't happen overnight, a lot of advocacy work, but a lot of sometimes the attention in our media and some of the reporters out there also combined with advocacy and science has been a wonderful storm that has allowed some pro proactive protect protective actions to happen while many of us have, at the national level are working on the policy change so that people shouldn't have to worry about the type of things they're bringing into their homes that all of it would be under the the uh, ceiling of you know basic health and wellness so sorry, I might have gone a bit out on tangent there, but uh, no, that's where that's, I would start with that. That's all good. Um, and and I do want to get there's some we want to sh sort of shift to some questions about sort of actions and, and the focus of like how we move forward. But I did want to um, give you, Christina and you, Sandra, an opportunity to sort of comment briefly on that grim versus hope question. Like, how do you approach telling those stories in ways that inspire rather than, you know, leave people feeling, feeling helpless. Maybe Christina start first. Sure. I am, um, you know, that's a big part of why my book is so focused on solutions. So there's a lot of information in the book that's really um, upsetting to learn as Ense talked about. I think um, I asked, I had like some friends uh, who were early readers of the book and they in that section, um, I read about Ensei where she's describing the kind of emotional cycle of like shock and then um, grief and then anger. Some of my readers were like, that's what I'm experiencing <laughs> reading this book too. And so I knew that that was going to be part of the experience for readers who, you know, um, maybe didn't have never had this information presented to them. And I really wanted the book to focus on the people who are trying to solve these problems. So, um, you know, I read some of Barry's story and her, and her story is about, um, having cancer and going through treatment and being concerned about her environmental exposures. Um, but everyone else profiled in the book is working towards solutions to this problem. And so I, um, learning those stories for me and not just the stories about like the work that NSA is doing, but the like childhood and family history that motivate her in this work and keep her coming back and able to keep doing this really, um, you know, kind of emotionally challenging work every day made me feel really hopeful and inspired um, as I was working on these stories as a reporter. And so my hope is that um, the book will do that for people too, that it, it kind of does give some space to, um, you know, explaining the scale and the breadth of the problem but that really leaves people feeling um, inspired by the work that these, that lots of really brilliant, uh, capable people are already doing on this front and then empowered to help out and pitch in and join the movement. Thank you. Sandra, thoughts on Grimm versus Hope? Well, I, th I think that what, what we've just heard is exactly right, that um, you can't downplay the grimness. Um, and so you have to, um, play out the magnitude of what's required. Like what's required of us is heroicness. It's not small things. It's like absolutely life-changing stuff. So for in my own work, um, I've chosen never to tell people what to do, even when they ask me, because I have come to believe that even though people think they want to know, you should, you know, buy this and not that, or get involved with this movement or fight for this or that that actually they're looking for an exit door because they'll evaluate the suggestion I gave and then say, they'll have 17 reasons why they don't want to do that. And then they'll, they'll use that to sort of exit. So I, I leave my readers in the uncomfortable place of never telling them what to do and simply showing them what I have, the changes I've made in my own life and how I've redirected, 
you know, I've given away my money. I've gone to jail. I've, um, we, the whole idea is that we have one life and why not lead it heroically? And there are heroes around us. Um, and that you can join together with these other heroes in this kind of David and Goliath fight. Um, and why not be David? Um, so, um, and then, then you have to do your own discernment to figure out where in this battle you want you want to join. <laughs> like, how do you want to be a hero? What are your tactics and strategies? What's your slingshot made out of that you're bringing to the Goliath of the chemical and fossil fuel industry? And that's something that you have to do through your own discernment. So, I don't ever. Um, I'm never scoldy. Um, and I'm never. Uh, try to operate um, by shaming people or making them feel guilty for not being involved. Um, but I also never give them a place to enter. <laughs> I never give them an on-ramp as a writer or a speaker. Um, I just sort of show them what I'm doing and what other people are doing. And I, I feel like um, what the power of the kind of reportage that Christina brings is that is that, that re reporters understand how political power work. Scientists don't always get that. And so um, it, it's the case that our policies and our laws are deaf to the, the new science showing that this is harmful. So we can, our whole regulatory system has become unresponsive to science. And so it's not gonna move because I, as a biologist, keep bringing more data forward to the policy. It's just not. And so it's going to require this kind of heroic activism and policy work that people are already engaged in. And so the, the trick is to show people that and then make them feel, through the power of your writing, that they want to be part of that too, that that makes your life really meaningful if you join this kind of, if you're also a hero. Well, I think that is a lovely note to end on. I feel like we could keep this conversation going all day long and it would be amazing to spend that time with you all. I have so much respect and admiration for the work that you all do and really appreciate you sharing your thoughts and, and wisdom and insights with us today. Um, I also want to thank everybody who joined us today, today's participants, and for your thoughtful questions. I know we didn't get to all of them. We will pull those questions down and, and share them with our speakers. And if they have a chance, they might be able to respond. We can put that up on our website. Um, but really appreciate your engagement. And also really appreciate our colleagues at the New School for co-hosting this with us. And with that, I'll hand it back to Kira for some final announcements. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christina and say Sandra. Um, this was just such a superstar panel of women doing amazing things in the world. So thank you all for doing this important work. And as Kristen said, thank you all for joining us. You follow us on our SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube pages. So thank you all for joining us at the New School at Commonweal and at the Che Cafe today. We'll see you next time, everyone. Don't take it, don't, 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 don't take it, don't, 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 don't take it, don't, 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 don't take it, 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 don't, 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 don't,